The Medicine Hat Fiber Arts Society is a community brought together by a common love of weaving, spinning, knitting and crocheting. Members have the use of this large, well-equipped studio. New members are welcome, with or without experience, and instruction is available. The Society is a member of a province-wide guild, the Handweavers, Spinners and Dyers of Alberta, which offers workshops and an annual conference. I love working with fibre because it combines my artistic, mathematical and scientific skills and I make something and I get such a sense of accomplishment when I make something beautiful and it's useful. I mean they do say that it originally weaving started in Peru and they have dug up fragments of cloth that are so complicated we still cannot today, or oh well, my generation couldn't understand all the complications. Nowadays with computers, I imagine they can. I noticed one or two people put their patterns on computers, but we just used maths in our heads, <laughs> or our hands to tell us what to do. I think feel is the best thing about fiber. Knitting should feel cozy, and weaving should feel smooth. You can put a silk scarf on and you can feel five inches taller and five pounds lighter because it's silk. And it's still one of the nicest things to weave with. Not necessarily practical, but a very lovely fibre to use. I still weave. I have a loom at home. As you come in my house, the curtains, the rugs, the towels, tea towels, I, I, I mean, I only use what I make, you know. I can't say that it saved me any money, but it certainly hasn't saved me any time when it takes like four or five hours to make a tea cloth, but that's what I like to do. I think everybody should spend a few weeks or even a few days learning how to weave. It's so easy to go to a store, buy something, and do you look at it and see how it's made? That's what I like about weaving. If somebody comes and it's something I've got and they look at it a second time, that's when I think I've got it made. You'd be surprised how people put things on and they have no idea how even a pair of socks are made now. And one day I stopped here and the door was open and I'm still here. So, and, uh, uh, they taught weaving and, and so forth, and it was a, a fair-sized group that did many disciplines uh, at that time. And uh, things kind of evolve. You do one thing for a while, then move into another, but we still have all the equipment to do those things. I, I uh, have always knitted since I was quite young and spun. My family came from Finland, and they, you spin if you come from Finland. That's how it is. So, and I had sheep, my own sheep, and it collected my own wool and so forth. But I hadn't woven before. I, this is where I learned to weave. Learning to weave wasn't a problem because weaving does not, forgive me, take a genius. It is a skill. Do A, B, and C, and D, E, and F will result. With spinning, it's completely a touch. Weaving is the exact opposite. It is very technical for an art. A and uh, what you have to learn to adjust to is your beat, getting that right so there isn't big spaces in between each row. But that comes with time and practice. But weaving is technical. You don't need an imagination because you follow a pattern, you thread by a pattern, and you follow a pattern. And um, while you're learning, you make lots of mistakes and they sure show up as you uh, learn more about weaving. Your mistakes are more obvious in your beginning. But it's something that takes practice. Some people catch onto it very fast. I didn't have a problem with it. If you wanted to learn to weave, everybody's point of view differs. I believe you should start with a scarf because there isn't a lot of warp threads to be involved with and you can get finished it and it's easier to see when you've made a mistake 
It's easier to see if your beat's good because your yarn is a bit heavier and it doesn't take as long so you don't get frustrated. These days I make a lot of felt. Felt is made of unspun wool, but it has to be carded. And I spin quite a bit and I do uh, silk screening. I, do, I still silk screen. And of course, everybody crochets and knits around here. It's, it's just par for the course. Uh, Fiber Arts has changed quite a bit in the, since the 70s because of the interests of the members. Uh, right now, most of our members are interested in weaving. Very few spin, but things do tend to go in phases. And knitting is very trendy right now. We have a fine facility, and the Cultural Center has all the studios and rooms. We, have, we belong to the Provincial Association of Hand Weavers, Spinners, and Dyers, and twice we have hosted provincial convention. Any kind of creative group is for a community, then people who feel the need to want to accomplish something have somewhere to go to do it. The interaction and the meeting, and uh, I, for one, have done demos in, in schools. I've always done demos in schools. I've always demoed at the Stampede, at the uh, Southern Alberta Summer Games. I demonstrated there. That was quite a number of years ago. But I have done a lot of public demonstrating. And it catches attention and it piques interest. And if no one does it, how can youngsters learn? It's a great place to be at Fiber Arts. We, we try to help each other. So, and, and that's the main thing, the fellowship and helping each other. I, I, anything I make, you wear on your back because if you're gonna go through all that work, let the whole world see it. It doesn't need to hang in your kitchen. And that is my total philosophy toward it. And uh, someone's walking down the street, you can spot something that's creative. And, and people approach whoever, the wearer and, and make nice comments and so forth. But I like making felt, yeah. It's, it's very rewarding and extremely versatile. You can do so much with color and everything. It's just my thing. Yes. I'm going to explain the uh, process of spinning. In order to weave or make anything wearable, you have to have yarn to do it with, and you do it by spinning. These days, modern technical processes, but there's the historic way. And it, you spin fleece. The main thing before you start spinning isn't that your, your, your fleece has to be clean. All the fibers have to be going in the same direction. So you comb them, so to speak, uh, with something called a carder. And, uh, when they, and uh, yarn can be made of most anything. Cotton, of course, the cotton fluff balls. Wool from sheep, which is what I'm using. Camel hair and yak is the uh, pricey one, of course. And musk ox, you buy by the gram. It's so expensive, so you can well imagine. But throughout history, the standard fare has been wool, fleece from sheep, and uh, a spinning wheel no matter what the design, they do the same thing. The big wheel turns and is hooked in by belts, and the bobbin turns much faster. That's how you get the twist. There's quite a difference in ratio between, you can see as you watch this, the bobbin is turning much faster than the wheel. This wheel I use does not look like the standard old-fashioned three-legged spinning wheel you see in all the movies. Uh, they're not very efficient. This is a very modern, highly efficient design, this wheel I use. And it has all sorts of different size bobbins and ratios, so you can do very fine silk or very, very heavy yarn with it. 
I'm doing a medium to heavy yarn just so you can see it. And as you see, there is no strength in the fleece at all. When you spin it, you put strength, the twist puts the strength into the yarn. And see how it curls? Now all yarn will curl like that because you have another process to go through after you have spun it. You have to set the twist in the yarn, which means you take it off and make skeins, big loose circles, and you soak it in water for at least 20 minutes. It takes wool 20 minutes to get wet through. Then you squeeze out the excess moisture, hang up the skeins with a weight on the bottom, and it will set the twist. There will be no kink in it. It'll, it'll be just like the yarn you see that comes from the stores. That's referred to as setting the twist. Once that's done, the yarn is ready to use. There, I, you have to start making your yarn with single ply yarn, which I have been demonstrating here. To ply yarn, you need two, two spools of yarn. When you, make, when you do single ply yarn, you always have your wheel going clockwise. When you ply yarns together, you go counterclockwise, otherwise it would get so dreadfully over twisted. And having them go counterclockwise does something else. It uh, loosens the twist and makes your yarn very, very soft. When, you, when your yarn goes through, the orifice here and comes out, you can't get your finger through there, it's just a tiny opening. So you have a, a hook that you can make out of anything, or you can use a crochet hook. Anything small with a hook on the end will do. We'll get this going, sorry about that. This is not exactly the fanciest way to start things, but all right. Now I have this down here, and I will turn my wheel counterclockwise. And both will come up. I have my finger in between the two yarns to keep them separate. I tried to do two different colors so you could see what would occur. The white yarn has a lot more twist in it than the colored yarn simply because the colored yarn was spun quite a while ago and the twist kind of got set just from sitting. Now I'll take some of this out. See how it doesn't, see how soft it's become? It doesn't curl upon itself, doesn't have a tight twist. If you're a very good spinner, when you ply yarn, you don't have to set the twist in it. Which, see, not that it, this, see how it doesn't curl up? So it, it's about how one would want it. And there is nothing automatic about spinning. When it's time to move the yarn, you do it manually. That's what all these hooks are for, to go down this way, back this way. So the bobbin will fill evenly. Actually, some of the modern ones do move automatically, but that, it's a little too modern. Flax, which is extremely strong. Uh, that's the fibers from flax are what you get linen from, cotton, the fluff balls from the cotton plant. And nowadays, they make a lot of fibers out of wood through chemical processing and so forth that you can spin. But silk is always the exotic. And I have some silk here. These are called silk hankies. They're pulled cocoons. Uh, silk comes from the cocoon of the silkworm. And see how you just pull it apart? 
I won't start spinning it because I'm flying right now, but, and you can spin silk very fine. It's a, an extremely strong fiber. Historically, par parachutes were made from silk because it was the strongest fiber there was. And silk does something else. Protein, protein comes from animals. Wool, silk, my, uh, musk, ox, and so forth are protein. And you use protein dyes for them and you can get very, very strong colors with protein dyes. Worms are animals, so to speak. So their silk is a protein fiber. And as you can see, it'll grab the dye extremely well. But I would need actually a, a finer head on my, uh, the finer head on my wheel to spin silk properly. So now I've demonstrated fine. We'll go back to, I'll spin a, I'll spin a bit of this silk as I say, it's a bit, it's not really fine enough, but silk is so very strong. I just have to get this going the correct way again. Historically, fine silk spinning was an art almost. You worked in the courts uh, in, in China and so forth. And another thing about spinning, it's totally a field, whereas weaving is technical. Do A, B, and C, and D, E, and F will happen. Spinning is a touch and a feel more than, more than a technical matter. It has taken anywhere from four spinners to seven to keep one weaver going throughout history it, in the days when uh, they spun and, and wove in the same shops in early times. But silk is very soft and, and nice and very strong. And you never spin silk thick and coarsely. It just is too fussy and too expensive to do thick. And silk is also a crisp fiber. I don't know if you can hear the sound it's making as I pull it. You would never hear that in wool. And you spin barefoot because if you've got a thick sole on, you, you, you don't get the feel of how the wheel is turning or how the pedal is going. You either spin barefoot or with socks on or a very thin sole sliver. You would never spin with big, heavy shoes on. Also, you stop the wheel with your foot, basically, and your hand, but you often start it with your hand, but you always put the flat of your hand on the outside of the wheel. If you grab the wheel and pull it, you will warp it eventually. And most spinning wheels go from generation to generation. Many uh, of today's spinners have great granny so-and-so's or so, but somebody's great granny's wheel. If you look after them properly, they will not warp. And they do have a bit of leather and wire and thread on them, which is easily replaceable. The actual wooden part will last indefinitely. And most spinning wheels are handmade therefore pricey. Uh, and there, there is uh, a lot of very good, fairly economical wheels out there. What makes a very good wheel? It's very good to teach people with. And uh, some of them are, some wheels are very fussy by design, but it's a matter of personal preference what you use for spinning. And you can see how fine this yarn is. Yet it's strong. It won't break. Look, that will break. That's a little too scrawny there. 
I will go back to doing some colored wool this time. This wool I am using is factory processed. I, have pro I process a lot of my own wool, but this is comes from the wool mill, an Alberta wool mill, Carstairs wool mill. And, uh, oh, excuse me, see, too much. Broke my little thread there. This thread here is called the tension that I just flipped over there. And it doesn't take much fleece to we to spin a lot of yarn. Uh, now this will be way heavier, of course, because it's wool. And this is a short staple wool. The white wool I was using is a very good quality wool. This wool is not near the quality. It's a short staple, which means short hairs. And uh, you won't have the quality or the evenness, but you certainly have the uh, color selection with the wools from there. Most of the wool grown in Alberta, sheep grown in Alberta, are Colombians. But it doesn't, and that's a meat sheep, but all sheep have to be sheared. They now have a hairless model or something, but basically sheep have to be sheared every year. So this one, of course, I'm spinning much coarser. You control the, the twist. You notice where the twist ends between my thumb and finger? Just by pressure on it. But see what happens if I let it go? It, it, it does what it wants, not what I want. And that's something that's about the hardest thing to learn when you start spinning. How to let the wool slide without it coming behind your fingers. Uh, there's many things you can do when you're spinning. I'll just demonstrate a couple of them here. Notice, all you do is hold your yarns together, the twist will secure them for you. You're gonna put in little bits of color. And it doesn't take much of a little bit to get a big bit. And then if you did this and plied the yarns together, they would come up very interesting. One of the most important things when you're going to be weaving is to prepare your yarn before you start. And I'm standing here at a piece of equipment that's called a warping mill. And I'm going to take my yarn and I'm going to use this warping mill to measure my yarn so that it's the proper length to put on the loom. And I've already prepared the, the uh, length on the loom and what I'm going to be uh, winding is a scarf. And the scarf is gonna be 50 inches long plus some fringe. And so uh, I start by putting the, the loop on and start winding. And away we go. And this warping mill will um, not only make uh, my length pro the proper length, it'll also uh, keep all the ends in line. And to do that, if you notice right on the top here is a, what's called a cross. And this cross is there to keep all the ends in line so that when I put the actual uh, warp on the loom, I'll be able to thread it in properly so that everything is in line. And that's really important if you have different colors because you want the stripes to be the exact width. So we just keep winding. And the other thing that uh, the warping wheel will do is it will create the width of the piece of uh, material that you're making. I'm making a scarf. So um, this scarf is going to be six inches wide and I will need 48 ends of warp to create this scarf. So it's a matter of just keeping on winding. <laughs> and so just with various calculations, I've decided that I'm going to have 48 ends to make six inches for this scarf. 
And if you notice, really, what I am really doing as I'm winding is I'm making a circle. It's really a circle. And so I'm going to make 24 circles. <laughs> and the end is just one of these pieces of yarn. Each one of these lengths is an end. So we'll just continue winding, and I'm almost there, actually. I think I'm on 18 ends here. So we can do four more. And then all I have to do is tie it off, or cut it off and tie it off. And uh... <laughs> okay, so I have my uh, right lengths and the right amount of ends. And then you can still see the cross that's here. And so it's really important to maintain this cross. So what I have is some shoelaces and I'm gonna tie these together so that uh, when I take it off of this warping mill, the cross will be maintained. Okay, so that is the cross is tied. Okay, so now I'm gonna take the warp off of this mill and make a chain. That. and then I pull the cross off and it's done and I'm ready to put this on my loom. I am going to demonstrate how to put a warp on a loom. It, it isn't complicated but it's very technical. It doesn't allow for errors otherwise your weaving will not turn out at all. You just have to follow the rules. First of all as was demonstrated earlier with the blue yarn, a warp was made, and the warp is now being put on the loop. And the warp is the long diagonal threads in woven cloth. So to put the warp on, you, when, it, when the warp is made, there is a cross in the warping board. You must always maintain that cross, and I have here with these two Lee sticks is what they're called. And notice they're tied together with a very modern technology, a shoelace. And uh, that's all that's required. And you use shoelaces because you use knots, and knots are easy to undo in a shoelace. So you thread your warp through your reed, and this one is an eight, eight threads per inch and it will be a loose weave. And to put it on, you have to take the cross you have here and get it to the other side of your reed. But before you start, you have to put your warp on the loom and you attach it to this. If it's a big warp, you would lace it all the way through. A small warp like this will just be slipped on to this lacing here. So first you undo the knot. I'll just put it that way for now. But you want it on evenly. Okay. You take the knot out of the stick that's already on this side, and you can let it drop through, just so long as you don't pull it out. Otherwise, you'll make a little more work for yourself. I'll just tie it to this because it's not very long right now. And that's the same as this one. Now, see how we have that little space in there? This 
stick will go through this one. There. And that's the same as this one. So now I'll take this one out. With weaving, you always tie knots, never bows. A bow can come undone. And if you lose this insignificant thing that is called a cross, if it is a big, fine project, it goes in the garbage, no matter how pricey the yarn, because there is no way to refine it. So that's why you don't lose it. There. And until we get the other half of the cross smooth, you make a point of not taking this stick out so nothing dangerous can happen. All right, now I will press it this way, there. There we go. And our cross is transferred. And another shoelace is in order. Or do you ha are you okay there? What, why don't we just try it right into here? When you roll the warp on, it's fiber, and of course it has give, so it winds evenly. You put little sticks in between to keep the, uh, the yarns from sinking into each other. And when you, when you put the warp on, the idea is to pull all your yarns evenly and tightly. Okay. Whoa. And carry on with the combing process. That's what fingers are for, combing. There we go. Oh, this is the beginning process of what is called dressing the loom. And normally a weaver will put on many, many feet or yards of warp because dressing the loom is your time intensive part. And uh, so you put on a lot, you can change weft colors, your horizontal colors quite easy. You can also change your design by changing the foot pedals. So 20 feet of warp is nothing. We have wound the warp on, and earlier I mentioned this cross business that we have to transfer, which we have. And no matter what it may look like, it keeps the threads in the exact order they were wound. If you get them crossed, they will snap when you start weaving, and you will have to do some repair work. And now that we have it on the loom, we have to take it out of the reed because we have to thread the heddles. Then you re-thread the reed. And just a loose knot is what you tie your little groups of thread with. There's no essential order or amount, just whatever you're comfortable with. Now that they're all off this, all through the reed, now you have to thread the heddles. You don't thread the heddles however you like. Uh, you use a pattern. Weaving is a very technical thing. There's uh, pattern books. They are easy to follow, but if 
Whatever pattern you want, you have to thread the heddles accordingly. It works like anything else that has a pattern. And uh, there are two things you adjust when you're, when you're weaving to get a pattern. How you thread your heddles and how you tie up your foot pedals. And one simple threading will give you a lot of variation. And you start at the outside edge, and we will be going four, three, two, one. And the cross prevents you from getting mixed up with anything at all. And you can see it takes time to do this. And if you're using a fine yarn, you can use up to 24 threads to do an inch of patterning. So uh, you don't want to make mistakes because you have to undo back to where the mistake was. So you want to do this with care and check your work frequently. So if you find a mistake, you don't have to undo too many yarns. But the order of threading the heddles is infinite for, for patterns. It's, it's limitless, absolutely limitless. Some of the things you can do with four harnesses of heddles. So every eight threads, I will tie another knot just so things don't get mixed up and cluttered up. And I just count one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, so I know there is no error in my counting. This is the slow part in, in weaving. Once you have your loom dressed, which means it's ready to weave, uh, throwing the shuttle, that's when weaving goes fast. But dressing the loom is a very uh, time and labor intensive event. Notice how I'm, they come up in the correct order because of the cross. And I have done eight more, so it's four, three, two, one. Four, three, two, one. And I know I haven't made a mistake in the heddles. I found out about the Medicine Hat Fiber Art Society about three years ago at a craft sale at the Esplanade, and then I came across it again at the Medicine Hat Stampede last July. I've always wanted to learn how to weave, actually as a young child, because there's so many unique things that you can make with the weaving, and I'm finding out that I'm really loving it. I could weave every day of the week. It's a different way to put an item together compared to other ways like knitting, crocheting, sewing, woodwork, metal. It's intricate. It's rewarding when you're finished the project. When you first join the Fiber Art Society, yes, you are assigned a mentor who helps you step by step to learn how to weave. And I feel it's very important because, as for myself, when I first joined, I had no idea how the process began. And without that mentor, I would not be here weaving today. There's lots of things that I have learned from the weaving. Um, I, th probably the first thing I learned was to be very patient. It's very time consuming. And one of the other very important things that I've learned is the quality of what you make is fantastic. I am doing tea towels right now and I love the tea towels. They're awesome. They're so absorbent and they're so soft and they will no doubt last, last you a lifetime. 
Actually, right now, because I'm still new to the weaving, I have only done a table runner, and now I'm doing tea towels. And my next project that I will be putting up will be a scarf. I will. If someone was thinking about joining the club to learn how to weave, I would highly recommend it as it's a wonderful club that we have here. The Fiber Arts Society is a great group. We have lots of fun and you learn lots. Now we are ready to start weaving. We are tied up to the loom and weaving involves casting the shuttle through the yarns, but the determination of how it goes through is done by the tie up of the sheds to the foot paddles. So there is six pedals, and I'm only going to use four. Normally when you're weaving, pedal number one and pedal number six are what they call plain weave. Every other one comes up when you press one. And uh, your pattern is normally the four foot pedals in between. So we will go with the four foot pedals, and I have a nice bright colored uh, weft yarn so we can see what's what. And you do half the pedals. Mm -hmm. You do half your treadling with one foot, then you change to the other. And that's how you keep order in what you're doing. It takes a bit of weaving when you first start out. It's called trashing. You can use any kind of material you like and you take it out when you take it off the uh, loom. And when it's a long piece, as Marlene demonstrated earlier, this is designed to throw. It's curved upwards so it doesn't go through your yarn. On a narrow little warp like this, you don't have anything to throw. So I'm just gonna get it going a bit here so we can. Another thing is with the foot pedals, once you've wove for a, a little while, you don't even need to be an expert. You can tell with bare feet what one you're at. Uh, I have started weaving and I've been weaving uh, the pattern specified it for the tie up and the threading I have done. And here I deliberately pressed a different one so you could see the mistake. And when you have two opposing colors like this, a mistake is very obvious. On a very fine thread with both the warp and weft the same colors, your mistake wouldn't show up very well but if you're an experienced weaver, you can spot a mistake about three and a half blocks away. Now this is just a twill, called a twill pattern. It's nothing earth shattering. And this one is called tabby, which is plain weaving. And that's the pedal number one and pedal number six. You normally tie it up that way all the time, so if you have to do plain weaving somewhere, do you see the difference? All right. So, so that's called tabby weaving. This is just called a twill design, this one. And you can do many complicated designs depending on how many threads, how this is threaded, and how it's tied up. And that is the the basic process of weaving. Here I am sitting in the Medicine Hat Fiber Arts Society studio, and I'm sitting at a loom. And you might ask, what is a loom? Well, it's simply a piece of equipment used to weave cloth. And you can take any kind of a yarn or a string and tie it into a loom, and you can make a piece of cloth, which you can make a, a clothing out of, or you could make a scarf, or a shawl, or even something as big as a tablecloth or a blanket on a big loom as this. 
So let's just take a look at how a loom works. The first thing you'll notice when you look at a loom like this is you see these long yarns that are, are tied onto the loom. And these yarns are called a warp, and it's the length of, the, of your um, material. And if you look on the end, the warp is tied onto the end of the loom, and then it is brought forward, and it is strung into these things here, these, these wires that have loops, and uh, they're threaded, the, the, the yarn is threaded through these, heddles is what they're called, and this is what produces the pattern of your uh, piece of cloth that you're going to make. And then as you come on through, what it does is it comes through a reed, and this reed, if you can look at it, it has slits, and these slits are called dents, and the reed will tell you how tightly your piece of material will be woven. Obviously, something that has wider dents will produce a piece of material that is not so tightly woven. Now I'm gonna just kind of demonstrate how it is that we weave. What we weave through is called the weft. And I have some uh, weft string here on, on this shuttle. And if you look down at my feet, you will see there's some petals down here. And this is the other thing that will create a pattern for me, is that as I push this pedal down, what it does is it opens up a tunnel here in this warp, and this is called a shed. And then I'll take my shuttle and send it through this tunnel or this shed, and catch it through on the other side, and then hammer it down in, and that's gonna create the weft. Now, the combination of the petals going down and how they're threaded in these heddles will produce the pattern. So I'm doing one, two, three, four. That's my petals. And I'm just going to do number three. And each, each petal will lift up different heddles. And that, that's what will, will give me the pattern. So there you have it. That's how a loom works. And it's, it's absolutely wonderful to see all the different types of things that you can make because there's so many beautiful yarns that you can get in wonderful colors. And it's something that I love to do and it's very relaxing. And the product that you get is just wonderful. Now that I've finished weaving my rug, I'm going to cut the threads here at the back so that I can take it off. So you just simply come to the back and start cutting the threads. We'll be careful here by the camera. Makes a bit of a mess, but you sweep up afterwards. Okay. Then we're going to come to the front. And we're just gonna gently pull it through. And because it's a rug, it's very heavy. Okay, so then you untie these threads. Actually, we're not even gonna untie them. We're not even gonna untie them. This is the fun part when you finally got all the work done and you get to cut it off and See what you really have for a finished product. Okay. And there we have two rugs. It's actually two. Finished drugs.
What I'm going to talk a little bit about is finishing. Um, finishing, actually, in this case, it'll be tea towels. So when we put a warp on a loom, we don't often put on a warp for just one piece because you've seen that there's a, a long process to put a warp on a, on a loom. You've got lots of little threads going through little places. So when I put a warp on for the tea towels, I actually put a warp on for eight tea towels and I brought some of them here. So the, the, the common color here is the, the natural color of the cotton and, and then I was able to use different colors. So the tea towels actually look quite different. So when I've got a long warp on a loom, how do I know when to start the next tea towel? And what I do is I actually measure. I measure my weaving from the beginning to the end, and I weave a hem. And in this case, the hem is a, is a different pattern than the body of the tea towel. And then when I've woven enough for the hem, I put in a couple of uh, rows or picks of a different color and then I know where that tea towel ends and where to begin the next one. So when I take this long line of tea towels off the warp, what I do is I zigzag on each side of the, the dark line. You can see it's actually black there. I zigzag it and then I can cut them apart and they won't come unraveled because they've been zigzagged. So then I cut just down the middle of that black line. There, and that, that black will come off and they'll have little bits of black all over. And then I've got a hem on the tea towel that I can turn under once and then turn under again. And I just make sure that it's nice and even all the way along and pin it. And I hand, I sew it by hand. Um, I, the other end is actually hemmed, so I can show that to you. I like to sew hand-woven pieces by hand. So that one, that one is already hemmed. Um, the other part of, of finishing is called wet finishing, and it's basically washing. So when, when fibers are spun for weaving, they're, they've got, um, sometimes it's spinning oil on it if it's a wool. If it's more of a cotton or a bamboo, it's got uh, something more like sizing and it gives it body and strength and it makes it a little more rigid and easier to weave with. So once I have, um, have these zigzagged, I can put them in the washing machine and I can wash that substance off them. So this one has come off the loom, but I haven't washed it yet. And I know you can't, you can't feel it, but maybe you can see that one is softer than the other. So it's, it's softer, that, that uh, sizing has washed off it. And the other thing that happens is that with, with cottons especially, you're gonna get shrinkage. And so when you're calculating how big a tea towel you want, you have to take that into account. Because what you've got here is you've got mm, probably a good two inches of shrinkage after you've washed it. So once it's, it's hemmed and it's washed and all the little threads are, are clipped off, then you've got a finished tea towel. So another way to finish um, some of the things that we weave uh, is to twist the fringes. And uh, I brought three scarves uh, today and that kind of shows you how, again, by putting one long warp onto the loom, um, I can get three scarves. And by, by using a different color that goes across, the fiber that goes across, you get a very different look for the three scarves. And these are very long scarves. They're, um, they're about six feet long, so you can wrap them a couple of times. That means that the warp that went on was very long because I had to leave room for these long fringes. So, um, and again, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the, the fibers and, and when they're spun. These fibers are bamboo and tensile. There's a mixture of two different fibers here. And 
these two scarves have been washed, so they're, they're kind of drapey. They've got a really nice drapey feel to them. This one hasn't been washed, and it's still got some stiffness from that sizing that's, that's on the weaving yarns. So once that's washed, it, it'll get very soft. And these haven't been ironed, um, but once they're pressed with a hot iron, they'll get a nice, nice shine to them. Um, so the two scarves that were washed have the fringes already twisted. So I'm going to show you here. And always, I always twist the fringes before I wash, otherwise you get a real tangled mess. So the ends of the warp are twisted and that, that keeps them from unraveling, it keeps them from getting um, caught together with each other. And what I will do is go back and, and press, press the ends and then cut them a little bit shorter so they're, they're a little neater looking. So the turquoise scarf, I haven't, um, I haven't done anything with the fringes yet. They're still long, so this was the last one that came off the loom and it has a, a long end on it. So what I've done is I've, I've pinned them to a board so, so that they're both along a line, an even line. And I'm going to take a rotary cutter. And I'm going to cut them so that all of the fringe is the same length. In this case, I'm just going to randomly pick eight inches. And I roll this along. my fringes are the same length and I don't need to worry about what's longer, what's shorter. And I have something here called a fringe twister, quite a, an ingenious little invention. So what I do is, um, it's a little like the spinning, I'm going to take two sections on the end of the scarf and each of the sections has about four threads in it because I've, I've sewn across, hand sewn across or hem stitched when it was on the loom. And each section has about four threads. And then I twist. And I twist until it's got a little bit of kink in it when I let go. Some people count how many times they twist and then they count when they twist backwards. And then I put them both in the same clamp and twist them backwards. And I pick how long I want it to be, probably about four inches. And I want the knot to go right about on that four inch line. And then I take the next two sections. Put them into the two clamps on the fringe twister. And I twist, for me I always twist to the right. So it's got enough twist that it, it kinks a little bit when I let the pressure go. And then I take, take the two ends and put them together in one of the alligator clips and I twist the other way. And then when I let go it, it doesn't kink up anymore and it's, um, it's got a nice neat twist to it. And then I want to tie a knot so it doesn't come undone. And I want that knot to be pretty much where the other one was so I get an even fringe at the end. And that's fringe twisting. So then I just keep going all the way across and do the other one. And then it's, it's ready for that wet finishing to take the finish off the fibers. This is called kumihimo. It's a Japanese braiding technique. The word kumihimo means gathered threads in Japanese. 
I learned about Kumihimo from a class I took at a provincial conference of the hand weavers, spinners and dyers of Alberta. And I took a class with Alison Irwin and she taught us how to do it. She also taught us how to design our own patterns. So today I thought I would show you the basic. Eight threads is the basic, it's the fewest threads they use. They use anywhere from eight to however far, 64 threads to make different braids and different flat. If you use a round disc like this one, then it makes a round uh, braid. If you have a square disc, then it makes a flat braid. So to start with, you put all of your, I'm just using embroidery floss, put it on a bobbin. So you just wind it up, you have to do it slow. I like embroidery floss because it has a nice shine to it. It's easily available and there's many, many colors. And today I'm just going to do a basic spiral. So you take all four, I have eight, take all eight threads, tie them in a knot. And then you take your disc, put the threads through the hole. This is a weight, it's just basically to keep everything to come through the hole. And when you have it like this, then you sort out your threads. And the, bra the disc has 32 slots. Um, it has the four points of north, south, east, west. And you, they are to use to organize the threads. So I'm putting my blue at north and south and my white at east and west. Look like that. And then once that's on there, you're ready to braid. It's that easy. So you have everything fairly snug. The first little bit's a little uh, looser just because you're getting organized. So to do the actual braiding, you start with the um, thread that's in the left hand side of the north. You bring it down to the right hand side of the south. And then you take the south thread that's on the left and bring it to the right of the north. You turn your disc a quarter turn and you just keep doing that same movement over and over and over. So that's all there is to it. Depending on how you set up your threads will depend on the patterns you get. There's many patterns available that you can find online or in books or patterns. And the, the Japanese, when they do kumihimo, they actually use a wooden stand, it's called a maradai, and they don't have any slots, any numbers on it. They just know where to place it. And they also use um, wooden bobbins that are weighted to hold the tension. When you use a foam disc like this, the thread is pinched in each of the slots and that helps with the tension so you don't need weighted discs for it. I don't really go by the numbers. You can, the instructions will tell you, take it from number 32 to put it beside number 17. But once you get the pattern going, you know to bring the left hand down to the right and then take the left up to the right. So the numbers really, um, you don't really need them anymore. I find it more complicated trying to work with numbers rather than left and right. So this, it's very basic when it comes to the braiding for, the, for this to just keep moving it. You just kind of unroll the disc or the bobbin as you go when the threads aren't very long. Just kind of give it a little twist like that. It comes out. You don't want them to be too long because then they tend to twist and tangle. But uh, the embroidery floss is nice and smooth so it doesn't tangle as much as some other fibers might. And you can use um, different thicknesses of fiber. Uh, if you're going to, to do a lot of this and you're of the kumihimo, 
and you want to do it with different thicknesses, it's better to have a, a different wheel for the heavier weight yarn because it'll make the slots spread. And if you use a heavy weight yarn and then try to use the finer yarn, then it won't keep the tension as well. So you just keep going. Um, as it grows, then you move the weight to keep the weight close to the hole of the disc. I find that it's something that you don't really have to think about once you get going. Um, like I was saying earlier, it's really easy to take on the airplane with you if you're traveling because there's no dangerous parts and you could do it within the confines of your seat. Um, you could do it, as you can see by the items on the table, you can add beads. If you had beads, you would have to thread each of them on the thread before you wind it on your bobbin. And then each time you moved a thread, you would just take a bead and slide it with your fingernail up to the top. If you take it and turn it upside down, take the weight off. Uh oh It's not quite long enough from the, the wheel to see it, but you can, you can start to see there's this, the spiral is starting to happen. You can see the white, the blue, and the white, and the blue and white. So usually you decide before you start what you're gonna use the braid for. Um, sometimes you're gonna make jewelry. Uh, these long ones here that I have, I'm going to make uh, cords for pajamas pants for my grandsons. So for the waistband of their pajamas. You could use it to make, um, I needed a new cord for my hoodie. So I just, like a drawstring. The Japanese people, when they first started doing this, they used it for anything that you needed to tie shut. You could make a cord. So. You can use it for uh, decorative trim that you could sew onto another project. Here at, Fiber, at the Medicine at Fiber Arts, we could use it to add detail to some of our hand weaving if we wanted. And when you set it down, this is important. See, I brought the one from here and I brought it down and this one here is ready to go up. But if you leave this one down and set it here, then the next time that you go to pick it up, you go, oh, I've got three here, then I need to move this one. And so that was an important trick to learn is how to set it down so that you can come back and keep going. So the items I have on the table, this piece here is small, but it's the first piece I made in the class with Allison. And it's designed to look like a rainbow trout. It's got the colors and that was the, uh, the illusion she wanted us to achieve. This one here is one. this one. I learned to do the bead work and so I had added the beads and um, the turtle just to make it look a little more fancy. This red and black one is the same pattern that I have started on the blue and white today and it's a spiral and I'm going to, when I get this piece done, I will actually take some of the red and black and make a warp down here in the necklace and weave it to make it um, have a center design. This one here is made with um, tensile, so it's a a shinier fabric, it's slipperier, it's a little, and it has the variegated yarn, so I didn't really put a pattern in it. I just put the eight strands on and, and the design from it actually comes from the, you can see here in the tail, the variegated threads. This is another one I did in the, that was just checking to see if I put um, these colors together, what will happen. And there's enough there, you could make a necklace or this is one I did in the class that we were to, it's to give you the impression of a, a rattlesnake because it has the diamond back on it or the diamond back snake. So that was one that Allison taught us. Um, these, these are other ones. I don't know if you can see this one close enough. It's got a little tiny bit of uh, the turquoise in it. I didn't use um, an even number of threads in the same colors. So that then it made, so you have a little tiny speck in your uh, diamonds and I thought that was just fun. Most of it's just learning, trying to figure out how to do it. Um, this one here with the elephant is shows how you can you can add beads but you don't have to do the whole thing beaded as the um, the turtle was. 
And this one and the one next to it are both ones that I did as I was traveling. And so I had threaded all the threads and it was just use up what, what I have on hand. And then I just put some plain kumihimo at the, at the end just for contrast. The yellow one with the mermaid was one I did on a trip and it was something I could take on, do on the airplane. And so then I just made it. I made the little piece first just to have a, an accent piece. And then I added the, the mermaid and the little fish to go with it. And this one, I'm going to turn this a bit. This one I made because I really liked the paisley. And so I took, the fun thing about using embroidery floss is I took the paisley to the embroidery floss aisle at the store and I picked out the colors that matched exactly to make it an original piece. And so there's lots of, of options for patterns. When you see a pattern, it'll show a picture of a circle and there'll be two dots at each north, south, east and west. And each dot will be the color that they want. And that's how they tell you to lay out your pattern. If you have the two dots, in my case, it would have been two blue at north and two blue at south to start. And then once you have it set up, then you just move your hands and keep going. And that's, that's how it goes. My first memory of knitting is actually of my grandmother. She used to always knit anything. She had 12 children, and so she was always knitting sweaters and blankets. And she liked to do uh, knitting as gifts, and she taught her daughters all how to knit. And so quite often at family gatherings, the ladies would all sit around and knit. And so as they visited, and you know, compared notes and shared patterns and so that's a, and my mom then of course was always knitting as I was growing up and so my sisters and I kind of learned how to knit without really being t like without having real instructions we just kind of picked up the knitting needles and continued on from there. I love to knit because you can take a ball of yarn a piece of string and two needles and create something. It doesn't, um, sometimes you use a pattern, sometimes you just create on whatever you feel like doing on your own. And it's amazing to me that somewhere back in time, somebody thought, oh, I'll just take this piece of string and two sticks and see what I can make. And years later, we're still doing the same thing. I think knitting was first invented as um, clothing, as something to help people keep warm and it just kind of evolved from there. It's still used for clothing, it's used for decorative items, pretty much anything you want. You can do flat knitting, you could do dimensional knitting. It depends on how willing you are to learn. In knitting, there's basically two stitches, a knit stitch and a purl stitch, but how you put them together is how you create patterns, and, and so then you learn how to increase and decrease, and that makes so that you can shape things. And then if you want to be uh, more creative, then you use more than two needles, and then you can make dimensional items. And so you could pretty much knit whatever you want. Knitting has taught me to be patient. It's taught me to do math, which I was my worst subject ever in school. But when you start doing these kind of things, then you have to know math. And so patience, I would say, is number one particularly for people who don't know how to do it, if you give them a gift um, of hand-knitted items, they're, they're so excited. I knit hand-knit socks for my little grandson, he's six, and he was just totally thrilled because they were knit just for him, he got to pick the color, and they were just fit his foot perfect. That's how he wanted them, and, and so he was so thrilled. And, and people that get a hand-knit gift are usually thrilled that partly that you would take that much time to make something just for them. So it's fun, to, it's a fun way to make very original gifts that are very much geared to the person, the, to the recipient that you're making the gift for. So the process of knitting is you decide first off, what would you like to knit? And then you decide um, what kind of fiber you would like to knit with. And so then you get a pair of knitting needles, you get a uh, ball of yarn that and the ball of yarn will tell you on the back of it it'll have a, a suggested needle size and so then you start 
Um, you get someone, hopefully you have a mentor that will teach you to how to cast on your stitches, which is when you start a project, you cast on the required number of stitches. That means you make little loops on the knitting needle that are the base for your project. And then you just decide you, if you want to put in more colors or, and if you have a pattern, well then you have to make sure you know how to read the pattern and what all the abbreviations stand for. In knitting, there's quite a few abbreviations, but um, there's easy to find charts or people that will tell you what the abbreviations stand for. So you have to be patient, you have to learn to memorize. If you don't want to sit there and follow the pattern step by step every time, then you memorize it so you don't have to always be looking at your paper or your pattern. And then you just take the time. If you make mistakes, you rip it out and start over. <laughs> so I'm going to cast on some stitches to make a dishcloth. This is dishcloth cotton. It's made for that purpose. Um, there's several different ways to cast on. My favorite way is called the long tail cast on. So you take a, a length, this is about a yard and a half, and you hold it in your hand and you, with your knitting needle, you're gonna pull the yarn toward you, loop it like that, and it makes two stitches the first time. And then you just keep um, scooping it up and this puts stitches on the needle so that you're ready to start your project. The long tail cast on, makes a very nice edge and so that's how I like it and it's very quick. It's how my grandmother did it and so that's how I learned. So I'm working on a hat and I put it on four needles to demonstrate how you can work with four needles. Personally I prefer circular needles. But. So I'm going to, you put your stitches on the three needles, divide them fairly evenly and then follow your pattern. So I am going to do a row of purl stitches. So then you just start knitting. Lots of people are afraid to knit with this many needles, but once your yarn, you got your stitches on the, the needles, they pretty much stay put. And you just let the two other ones sit there while you're not working with them. And as you knit the stitches off of the first needle, then it becomes your empty needle. Then you just take the empty needle, move to the next needle full of stitches, and keep purling. So, depending on your pattern, it'll tell you what you should be doing, and you sometimes have to, this is just purl every stitch so you don't have to count. Sometimes as you're working, you have to keep counting and so then you can't talk. So, so this is the end of my pattern row there. And now I'm going to change and I'm going to knit the stitches. And so then the bumps will form on the back of the knitting. So you can see here that the bumps are now changing to the back. And so they'll be nice and smooth on the front where I'm actually working. They say back to the 1500 BC that people have crocheted. It's, um, well, it's an ancient art. I guess then they would have used it to make uh, material to wear um, and carving uh, hooks out of bones. Um, as far back as 1743, the Royal Dublin Society gave out prizes for Irish crochet, and Queen Victoria was an avid crocheter. Um, the word is derived from the French um, word meaning hook, and, and it's just, um, it's a fantastic hobby. It's, you, can, you can make anything. Anything you can knit, you can crochet. Um, we have man's sweater, um, bedspread, blankets, children's clothing, toys, just anything you can, can do. This is called fillet crochet. It's done with what they call blocks and spaces, which is double crochet and 
um, chains. And it's, uh, this is a table runner. I've used this technique to do curtains. You can, um, you start out with a, a row of uh, chain two, double crochet, chain two, double crochet. And then to uh, form your pattern, it's uh, a block consists of three double crochet and a chain, a, a space is a double crochet, chain two, and a double crochet. And that's what forms your pattern. A double crochet is you yarn over, go through your stitch, pull up a loop, yarn over, go through two uh, um, loops, yarn over, and th go through two loops. A chain is you yarn over and go through one loop. I think it's very satisfying to, to make something that can be either worn or used. Um, and the fact that I have great grandchildren now, I tend to do the little things. And it's great having little things to do when you're traveling in a vehicle. You can just tuck it in your bag and away you go. I find it very relaxing, very, yeah, just keeps you sane. I use cottons, I use um, wools, um, some alpaca, yarns, um, just, you can use pretty much anything. Cotton thread, yeah, just any kind of yarn, any, you can, you can pick up anything and you, and make it. Plastic bags cut up, t-shirts cut up, recycle, recycle, reuse. It's, it's a good thing, it's a useful thing. The most unusual thing I've crocheted would be probably a pair of socks. And they were, I find them much easier to crochet than they are to knit. Because I have trouble knitting the heel on a pair of socks, but to crochet a pair of socks was very easy. But then I've been crocheting for a lot of years, so. What we have here is a circle sweat, uh, sweater. It started in the back as a circle and just went around and around. And you added the sleeves. And you went around and did the second sleeve. And then that's all there was to it. We have a baby blanket with the very thick baby yarn. And it feels kind of rubbery. This is just a um, dishcloth we have. It's called a granny square. You just go around and around and around in a square. This Peggy did this many years ago. This is filet crochet, which is what I'm doing here. And it's a purse. This is Doris's baby sweater that she does. The way you get the different look is by using different stitches. Like she's used sort of a puff stitch here and just single crocheting around the, co the collar. And under here is just a single crochet. And this is like a, a rib stitching. Uh, you do a rib stitching and knitting but in uh, crocheting, it's done differently, but it does the same effect. She did a sweater for her husband. What kind of stitch did you? A granite stitch, it's called. A granite stitch. And it's very heavy. She does these little purses that has little dolls in them. You just bring them up and pull the drawstring and you have a little purse. 
Little kids just love them. This is something that another lady made 30 some years ago for her daughter. So it's very versatile, it lasts for years. This is crochet cotton. It's very, it's not as soft as an acrylic. Acrylic is uh, what you would use for sweaters, baby clothes, um, afghans, uh, dresses, whatever. This is more for bedspreads, doilies, my table runners, curtains. It's uh, a mercerized cotton. Doris is using a red heart. Acrylic. It's an acrylic. I like to make the little dress tops and add either fabric to the, to the skirt or tulle to make a little ballerina dress. Um, this is a little dress and jacket set. And this is a bedspread I made quite a few years ago and it fits, it will fit a king size bed um, and, a, and a blanket. It's just good to be able to crochet things to wear and use. And What I like, it works up a lot faster than knitting. And I find it more relaxing than knitting because if you make a mistake, you can rip it out a lot faster and uh, find your mistake a lot easier and uh, work back to where you were from, from the mistake. It's just much easier to go on from it. it um, I like some of the, like, I like making doilies and filet crochet. That's one of my things. And I like doing uh, baby sweaters in crochet. I like the effect of it. It, it just seem, just does a different effect than knitting. It just, it, and it works up a lot faster than knitting. If you're making something, it works up a lot faster. It, knitting is very slow. Once you get into it, it's really interesting actually, because you're always learning a new stitch, a new, a new way of doing things. Um, so you keep learning with this too. It, just about every everything you make that you can you learn how to do something different yeah so that is what we do at the medicine hat fiber arts society basically we're a group of people that loves to get together and we love to work on all kinds of fiber whether it be spinning or weaving or knitting crocheting felting we do it and we're always interested in, in uh, new people coming and joining the group. And if you're interested, we certainly would love to hear from you. We're usually here at the studio every Tuesday, somewhere around between 11 to 3 o'clock. And um, we'd love to have you just come and visit and ask us any questions. And um, we'd love to learn from you also. And it'd be great to see you.